everybody, Dr. Alwes here. In this short video, we're going to talk about the nervous system structures that help to regulate the process of respiration. When we think about controlling the process of respiration, this is the inspiration and expiration rates, the two primary brain structures that, that regulate this process are the medulla oblongata and the pons. If you remember from AMP1, the medulla oblongata and the pons are both found in the part of the brain called the brain stem. So this is a part of your brain that is not consciously controlled. All of your conscious thoughts and processes occur here in the cerebrum, that upper part of the brain. So when we're thinking about the functions of the medulla oblongata and the pons in the process of respiration, they do slightly different things. The medulla oblongata has a, a couple of structures in it that when they work together, we call them the medullary rhythmicity center. The name medullary rhythmicity center gives us an idea of what the function of these parts will be. Let's underline highlight star that they're setting the respiratory rhythm. Rhythm being how quickly or how slowly you're breathing. There are two parts to setting this rhythm. The first part is what's done by the ventral respiratory group. The ventral respiratory group is found on the front side of the medulla. Ventral means toward the front. The ventral respiratory group is what actually generates the signals that cause us to start the process of inhalation. Now, as the ventral respiratory group generates a signal, this signal can be modified or altered based on feedback from the dorsal respiratory group. So in a moment, we'll talk about the kinds of things that this dorsal respiratory group might be listening for, but this would help us to change either um, how deeply we're breathing or how shallowly we're breathing. The dorsal respiratory group is going to alter the signals. The ventral respiratory group creates those signals. In addition to creating and altering the signals, we also use what's called the pons, that upper structure, with its pontine respiratory center to smooth out the process of, of breathing. So the pons is going to help us with regulation of the muscles that are involved in inspiration and expiration. Remember that the primary muscles that we contract during inspiration are the diaphragm, which pulls down, as well as our external intercostal muscles. So ensuring that those muscles receive signals smoothly to expand and contract, this is the job of that pontine respiratory center. When we talk about being able to modify the process of respiration, there's two main ways that we can do this. So the first thing that we can, can change is the rate at which you're breathing but we can also change the depth at which you're breathing. Now, the rate that we're breathing is determined by the number of signals that come from the medullary rhythmicity center. If we want to breathe more quickly, we would send more signals to the medullary rhythmicity center. If we want, or from that center, excuse me, if we're breathing more slowly, fewer signals come out. So your breathing rate is set by the number of signals that are sent from the medullary rhythmicity center. The strength of those signals, so the work of that dorsal respiratory group, is going to impact how deeply you're breathing. So a very strong signal would lead to a very deep inspiration, whereas a weaker signal would lead to a shallower inspiration. Notice that there are many different uh, types of receptors that our body uses to determine how quickly or how deeply we should be breathing. Some of these signals that they're detecting lead to an increase in respiratory rate or, or breath, uh, how, how strongly you're breathing. Some of these factors would actually decrease the process of, of inspiration. So let's look briefly at some of the factors that influence your breathing rate or your breathing depth. One of the big things that we use in the, to monitor the process of breathing are what we call chemoreceptors. And I want you to underline, highlight, star chemoreceptors. We see this particular type of neuron both in the medulla oblongata, the medullary chemoreceptors, as well as in the carotid arteries and the aorta itself underline highlight star chemoreceptors. Chemoreceptors detect changes in chemicals. 
In the case of my chemoreceptors that live in the medulla oblongata, the kind of chemical changes they're looking for is how much carbon dioxide is present in the blood or what's going on with my pH. Remember that if my blood carbon dioxide levels go up, this will also lead to an increase or a decrease in my blood pH. More carbon dioxide makes that blood more acidic, which is a drop. If the medullary chemoreceptors detect this drop in pH or this increase in carbon dioxide, they're going to send signals to the medulla oblongata saying, hey, let's increase our, our respiratory rate or let's increase our respiratory depth. So the medullary chemoreceptors monitoring carbon dioxide. The types of chemoreceptors we find in our arteries, the carotid artery or the aorta, they're monitoring the level of oxygen. If the level of oxygen in your blood drops, this is also going to lead to an increase in the rate of breathing or the depth of breathing. We might also see increases in uh, the, the rate and depth of breathing, uh, for example, based on proprioceptors. Proprioceptors are stretch detectors. If they detect that your body's muscles and joints are getting stretched out, this is what happens when we use those muscles, that would be a signal to the, to the brain that we need to increase our respiratory rate. Uh, we are exercising. We need more oxygen to these areas. When we have painful stimuli, so we touch something that's sharp, we touch something that's hot, you have that gasp of air when something hurts, that comes from these receptors, uh, somatic receptors throughout your body, telling that uh, medullary rhythmicity center to cause a sudden gasp. Notice that we do also have some feedback that would slow down the respiratory rate or depth, and this is something called the Herring-Brewer reflex. The Herring-Brewer reflex is your body's way of monitoring how stretched out your lungs are. If our lungs are very stretched out, if we're tripping this reflex, this is going to lead us to send a message to the medullary rhythmicity center and to the pons saying, whoa, slow down, we don't need any more oxygen. So when we're thinking about modifying your breathing rate and your breathing depth, all of this kind of sensory stimuli is taken in, uh, processed in those breathing centers that we talked about on the previous slide to determine how quickly or slowly and how deeply or shallowly you're breathing. Putting it all together in a typical breathing context, uh, we kind of see a circle like this. So let's suppose that you're doing your regular day-to-day -day thing. Over time, the level of carbon dioxide in your blood and in the cerebrospinal fluid next to the medulla oblongata starts to increase. With this increase in carbon dioxide, my chemoreceptors, in this case, particularly in the medulla oblongata, are detecting these chemical changes. Those chemical changes tell the medulla we're not breathing often enough. So the medulla oblongata sends out a message causing our inspiratory muscles to contract. These are the muscles that allow you to do a big inhale that start the process of breathing. So as we send a message to those muscles to contract, the rate of respiration increases. With the rate of respiration increasing, we get rid of some of that extra carbon dioxide that was circulating in the bloodstream. This decreases the pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood, which means those chemoreceptors are no longer detecting it. And when they're not detecting it, they slow down your breathing rate. But notice, as we slow down the breathing rate, we start to retain a little more carbon dioxide. And as we retain that carbon dioxide, the pressure goes up and we start this process over and over again. So the process of respiratory rhythm, setting how quickly you're breathing, is something that we're constantly monitoring and constantly changing to ensure that the level of carbon dioxide or the level of, blood, of oxygen in our bloodstream remains relatively stable. Now there are two particular conditions I want to mention for you that relate to changes in respiratory rate. And this is when we're doing exercise 
and when we're, we're doing the process of hyperventilation. Both during exercise and hyperventilation, we see a, a respiratory condition called hypernia. Hypernia is my fancy way of saying that we've increased the rate and the depth of our breathing. Now, when we think about the process of exercise, this makes sense. As our body starts to become active, as our muscles are requiring more oxygen, we're going to trigger those signals for breathing more rapidly. In exercise, let's underline highlight star that we're changing these things to meet the body's metabolic needs. To meet the body's metabolic needs. This is critical because when we breathe more quickly during exercise, we're actually going to match the rate of bringing oxygen in with the rate of spitting carbon dioxide out. That is different than when we talk about hyperventilation. During hyperventilation, again, we're breathing more quickly. We're seeing this hypernia occurring. But in this case, we are increasing, let's underline, highlight star, unnecessarily. Now, the stereotypical time when we're hyperventilating is when we're feeling anxiety, for example. We start breathing much more quickly than normal. With us breathing so much uh, more quickly compared to normal, the level of oxygen in our blood increases and increases and increases to a point where we actually have too little carbon dioxide. We use that carbon dioxide, remember, to change our blood pH or to regulate what's going on with the level of oxygen in the bloodstream. If we have too little carbon dioxide in the blood, this is a condition called hypocapnia. Hypo meaning too low, capnia referring to carbon dioxide. So here's the big picture difference between exercise and hyperventilation. In exercise, we're matching how much oxygen comes in with how much carbon dioxide goes out. In hyperventilation, we're sending out too much carbon dioxide and bringing in unnecessary oxygen. This is what leads to some of the issues that we see with hyperventilation. If there's not enough carbon dioxide in your bloodstream, your blood vessels will actually constrict. They'll get smaller because they're missing that carbon dioxide. And with that constriction, we can end up with things uh, like passing out, for example, not getting enough blood flow to the parts of the body that need it. So to recap, we use the pons and the medulla oblongata to determine your breathing rate and your breathing depth. We constantly keep these things in balance based on the level of carbon dioxide in our bloodstream. We can change the breathing rate and depth either in response to exercise or in the case of hyperventilation, in response to anxiety. But we always want to make sure that we're matching the amount of oxygen that comes in and carbon dioxide that's going out to what our body actually needs, those metabolic needs of ensuring that our cells can function correctly.